When I was a little kid in uh, Sunday school in the 1960s, I learned a song, and I'm not going to sing, unless you want to sing, but um, I, I remember the song. Uh, it was, it's called Praise Him, Praise Him, All You Little Children. How many know this song? See, you know it. Who wants to come up here and sing it? Um, uh, praise Him, Praise Him, All You Little Children, God is Love, God is Love. Praise Him, Praise Him, All You Little Children, God is Love, God is Love. Uh, and then verse 2 is... Uh, uh, love him, love him, all you little children. Uh, and then the last one is uh, thank him, thank him, all you little children. Uh, and, you know, three verses, kind of Trinitarian in structure. Great, great little song. Uh, but as I was thinking about that song this week and looking at Psalm 146, which, which uh, the last uh, few psalms here, they're all praise psalms. Uh, so if, if you're wondering what we're going to speak on while we finish the Psalter, praise God. That, that's what we're going to speak on. That's what each one is about. Uh, and how can you spend that much time talking about praising God? Oh, we could probably go into June easy. Uh, but there's so much to talk about. And when you think about, you know, little Sunday school for children, I mean, that impacted me as a child. What's my role as a Christian? But it was to praise God. Uh, and to praise him, uh, it says there, because he's love. Well, how do I know he's love? Well, he left heaven to be my savior, go to the cross for me, die for me. Uh, so I can praise him for that. And... Um, so there's much to praise him for. And, and as we conclude the Psalter and look at this final praise song, uh, I know it's only 10 verses. You're looking at it going, wow, there's only 10 verses. The more I poured into this, my notes just exploded all over the place. So uh, there is a lot here uh, that we want to like glean from. So um, what we're going to find here as you look at these uh, particular verses is, the, is uh, the main motif, I would say. Uh, I usually put things in a question format, but I'm going to put it in just in a definitive statement. Uh, if you were to summarize, like, the main idea here is divine praise should captivate your life. It should captivate your life. It should be what you are about. It's what you think about. When you get an opportunity to praise God, I mean, it should just come natural. And when you look at how this uh, particular thing is structured uh, from a um, rhetorical perspective, uh, the first verse says, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. Then if you go down to verse 10, uh, it says, uh, the Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Then it closes with, uh, praise the Lord. Uh, those those three uh, words uh, tell you what you should be about. Uh, it's it's called inclusio as a figure of speech. Uh, inclusio, as I've told told you before, in case you have for, how many have forgotten what inclusio is? How many are lying? You know, uh, inclusio is you begin and you end the same way, and it's a great way if you ever do public speaking. You start out this way, and then you come back here, and bam, it's the same thing down here. You drive home your point, but it's a uh, from a rhetorical structural perspective, it's like putting a big bow around something beautiful. And it's like, that's just a gorgeous present. When I, when I wrap presents uh, at our house for Christmas, they do not look like my wife's. <laughs> you know, like, what's up with my bow? It's kind of laying down limp and everything. Hers are beautiful and everything. So she's got the inclusio thing going on. Um, that's what this psalm does. So if you're wondering, is, what was today about? Okay, we're done. We can go to uh, Spartans for uh, brunch, right? Um, so let's look at it. So we're gonna, there's four things that he's going to uh, put into this uh, inclusio format. Uh, to teach us about making praise as part of our lives. Uh, and the, the first part is what I would call the rule of praise, verse 1, where he says, praise the Lord two times. So he's, he's redundant on purpose because he wants to get your attention. And, and the praise the Lord, praise the Lord twice here, both of those are Hebrew verbs. In fact, if you study Hebrew, uh, there's hifil verbs, there's cal verbs. This is called a, a pl verb, which I've never mentioned to you. I usually don't get too granular into the text, but this is important. Like, why is it a pl verb? Because a P-I-E-L P -I -E -L, uh, is a factative verb. Oh, uh, it, it's a fact that you should do what? Praise the Lord. So it's not optional. Uh, you shouldn't yawn at this as a Christian. You should look at this and go, man, I got I to get my act together. What does God want me to do? He wants you to praise him. And he wants your soul to do it. All that is you. So if you think about, I was sitting there thinking this week, like what does praise do? Like when I praise God, what's it do for me? Well, the, for me, it does multiple things. Uh, it takes my mind off of... Uh, the, the issues that I see, that I face in my life, and it puts me on the main thing, God. And I tried it this week because I'm facing a, a, an issue uh, with the passing of my father-in-law and, you know, going through the complexities after death, all the things you have to do, and there's an issue. And uh, I, was, I was all, I overthink things. If you, I don't know how you are. I just, yeah, I can't turn the brain off. It's two in the morning. I'm awake thinking, pros, cons, and all this stuff. And, uh, and I thought, what am I studying this week? terrible to get convicted by your own sermon, you know, and it's like, well, so I stopped worrying, I'm like, 
God, you've taken me through this whole dementia, Alzheimer's process with my father-in-law. You've been awesome the whole way. I will just give this to you, and I praise you for the difficulty of this moment. And it was like peace. I'm serious. Peace. It's like God's like, hey, Marty, I was with you for the last two years in, the, in this. I'll be with you in this. And so uh, I'm speaking that I've been convicted by my own, by my own sermon uh, to praise God, even in the middle of the night. So uh, if you're fresh out of ideas about praising the Lord, uh, well, then focus on the, the fact of who he tells you to praise. Who does he tell you to praise here? No, it's the Lord. Uh, capital L-O-R-D. Yahweh. This is not Adonai. This is Yahweh. This is not Elohim. Uh, no, that's the creator God, Genesis 1, 1. This is Yahweh. This, uh, we've talked about this before, uh, and we need to talk about this again, just to remind you a few basics of L-O-R-D, uh, Lord, Yahweh. Um, because this is, the, is what is called the tetragrammaton, the four key consonants to the name of God, how mighty he is. And the, and the scholars are not real clear on what vowel pointing uh, were put in there because the Masoretic scribes did, didn't put vowel pointing into the text until around the 9th century, 10th century uh, A.D. Uh, and so uh, well, how did they pronounce these? Imagine reading your Bible with no vowels. And all the words ran together. Uh, that's, that's how it was. And so they didn't, they're not really quite sure. And plus the Jews wouldn't even say the name anyway. So whenever they would come to the name, the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, uh, they would leave the vowels out. They would put in the vowels for Adonai. So you didn't say the holy name. Imagine how, having such respect for God, you won't even pronounce the name. Amazing. With all that in mind, we know that his name is a verb because I've told you that before, right? You remember, right? So when Moses uh, goes, uh, it, and it's the verb Hayah, is what it means, and it sounds like a karate move or something, doesn't it? Just saying. Uh, but his name is a verb, and we know it's a verb because in Genesis 3, when God uh, it reveals himself to Moses at the burning bush, uh, here's, the, here's how the conversation went. Uh, then Moses said to God, behold, and he's an old man in his 80s, I, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I'm going to say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, he says, I know these Jews. that They're going to say to me, okay, you talk to God, what's his name? What's his name? What am I going to say to him? I don't know your name. And God said to Moses, I'll tell you my name. What is my name? I am who I am. And he said, thus shall you say to the sons of Israel, uh, I am has sent you. Um, I don't know if we have the Hebrew text. Yeah, we do. It's easier to read the other one, isn't it? So uh, in Hebrew, you <laughs> in he Hebrew, you read from right to left this way, and then those are the vowels down below the consonants. And so you read right to left, but you read up and down like zigzaggy as you go along. So this is a Yomar Elohim El Moshe, Ihye Asher Ihye. I am. I get the chills when I read that. This is God said. This is my name. My name is a verb. I am the ontological one. I always am. Aren't you glad He is? Because this is what He says to Moses. He says, uh, "Let me say. Let me tell you what my name is." Uh, and when you think about this, uh, it underscores His um, eternal nature. Uh, Paul talks about this, the great rabbi, uh, uh, speaks about it in Romans chapter 1. Notice what Paul says about why you should praise God. He says in Romans 1.19, uh, he says, and he, if you read 1.18, we covered Romans a couple years ago, but when you look at 1.18, Paul talks about how the, the world, the godless, suppress the knowledge of God willfully. They know it, but they suppress it. Uh, and notice what he says here, because that which is known about God is what? Evident. Evident where? Within them. Why? Well, God made it evident to them. Well, how do you do that? Well, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, like his omnipotence, his omnipresence, all of, his, all of that, uh, it, these invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been hidden? Nah. Clearly seen. Uh, being understood through that which has been made so that they are without excuse on judgment day. Anybody that says that, oh, I just, I never knew you were there. Oh, yeah, you did. He said, I put it in your heart to know that there's a divine being. And all you had to do is look at the world around you to understand there has to be a God who made all of this complexity. So if you're an atheist, an agnostic, a skeptic, etc., no matter how airtight you think your arguments are, you, by definition, argue against reason. I mean, you claim the Christian has no reason, but they're the ones with the reason, and you argue against reason. That's Paul's argument. Uh, and he goes on to say, when you read uh, Romans 1, that they even can see the Godhead, the Trinity. Because how do you define uh, great complexity? And something, if something has to be greater than the complexity to make complexity. So this is why I am not uh, a Muslim, because their concept of God is a strict monotheism. I could totally understand it. 
This is why I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, and like some of my family members are, because it's a strict monotheistic view of God that I can totally understand because there's no mystery of his being, but Trinitarianism is, huh? It's probably the most asked question I'm asked by people. Could you, could you explain that to me? Uh, well, to a degree, but beyond that, he's a mystery. Uh, because he is one, because Genesis or Deuteronomy 6, 4 says, Behold, our Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. The, one can, the Hebrew word, achad, one, can be one in singularity or one in complexity. Or just use logic. Where did all the complexity come from? Some being I can't quite grasp. And so he says it's been clearly seen. So that man on judgment day are without excuse. When I got out of college, uh, learning uh, you know, more about my faith, uh, I started reading apologetic books. Uh, and I read, uh, one of the first books I read uh, when uh, I was right out of college, and I got married, I think, two weeks after I graduated from college. And I started reading. I read Francis Schaeffer's He Is There and He Is Not Silent. It's only about 99 pages. I started with a small book. Um, and what he talks about in there is uh, God, uh, chapter one, he talks about God is the metaphysical necessity. It's an awesome chapter. Uh, and in that particular chapter, he talks about that nothing, uh, from nothing comes nothing. Uh, and he goes on to state in that opening chapter, no one has ever demonstrated how time plus change, or ch time plus change, uh, beginning with the impersonal, can produce the needed complexity of the universe, let alone the personality of men. No kidding. It's just simple logic. Uh, and uh, he teaches the impersonal, and the complex can only spring from, as he says, from God, who is personal and highly complex. It's just logic. Uh, Peter Atkins, uh, who is, remember, we're studying Why Should You Praise God?, the Lord, the ontologically always one? Well, because of who he is. See, Peter Atkins is an Oxford chemistry professor who smugly claims as an atheist, quote, humanity should accept that science has eliminated the justification for believing in cosmic purpose and that any survival of purpose is inspired only by sentiment. To which I would say, uh, Peter, have a clue. <laughs> You're kidding me? Because my foundation of understanding God's not based on sentiment. It's based on facts. It's based on evidences. Uh, and uh, those can be easily understood if you think about it. There's a lady named Nancy Piercy uh, who wrote a book with a man named Charles Thaxton. Uh, I, read it, I read it about a year ago. It's called The Soul of Science, uh, Christian Faith and Natural Philosophy. It's an excellent book. Um, she's got degrees in science, very smart woman. Uh, she wrote a lot of books with uh, Chuck Colson. Uh, but uh, she says here in the, in the opening chapters about scientists, uh, she said the early scientists did not argue that the world was lawfully ordered, and therefore, there must be a rational God. Instead, they argued that there was a rational God, and therefore, the world must be lawfully ordered. Absolutely right. Uh, and when we look at God being the metaphysical necessity as the, the verb of the always existing one, which just totally makes sense. Because as she's going to argue in that book, if you like science, read this book. It's awesome. She explains there could be no science if there was not a God. Why? Because science is based on rational thinking, right? Uh, and there can only be rational thinking if there's a rational God who built rational thinking into the cosmos. Um, why, why is there irreducible complexity in the cosmos if it was just, if everything's here by bland, blind random chance? That's incongruent. Um, John Lennox, a great mathematician in England, says this. He says, as it's hard for us to get to any kind of picture of, of the seething, dizzyingly complex activity that, occur, that occurs inside a living cell which contains within its lipid membrane maybe 100 million proteins, 20,000 different types, and yet the whole cell is so tiny that a couple of hundred could be placed on the, on the dot of the letter I. And it just happened. All that complexity. Uh, I'm not going to believe that. That's why I, when I was in school, I always engaged my, my teachers. They would say stuff, and I'm like, uh, question. Um, because uh, I was, you know, in high school, I was like, that, that doesn't sound right, you know? If you take it logically out for a drive, does your view drive? No, nah, you just wreck the car. Uh, because uh, when you look at God being the answer to all things, you have to have him just to have science. Because if I have a hypothesis and I want to test it, I have to go through certain disciplines to come at a rational conclusion. Where's that come from? Rational God, built it into the cosmos. Why are we studying all this so early in the morning? See what I mean? Verse 1, we could just park there all day long. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, Yahweh, the ontological one. He's a necessity for all of life. So next time you start wondering uh, how you should praise him or what you should praise him for, just think about his name. And if you really like to dig into science and you like the anthropic principles, which, you know, Greek, anthropos, man, 
but just study all the anthropic principles and praise God for each one of them. You know, because we live on a razor edge of we're here, we're not here. You know this, right? You can talk to me. It's okay. I know it's early. But uh, J.P. Moreland. I know we're still in verse 1. We're moving. J.P. Moreland, great apologist in, in uh, L.A., says this. He says, if gravity's force were infinitesimally stronger, all the star stars would burn too quickly to sustain life. If ever so slightly weaker, all stars would be too cold to support life-bearing planets. If the ratio of electron to proton mass were slightly larger or smaller, the, the, the sort of uh, chemical bonding required to produce self-replicating molecules can't take place. No life. I mean, it goes on and on and on. I've been reading this stuff all week. I've been reading it for years. Because what does it say? God, the rational one who is made this beautiful planet to be exactly where it is in the Milky Way galaxy, strung out on a perfect arm so that we're not, if we were in a different location, we couldn't see anything. He put us way out on the edge of a Milky Way arm as we're spinning around in space and so we could see the wonder of what he made. And then who would conclude, there's no God? No, the Christian sees that and goes, man, I learned this morning in the church. I got to go with the program. What's God want from me? What's the rule? You forgot it already? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Point two, we're on to verse two, the resolve of praise. He says, uh, beyond the rule, okay, God, he says, I'm going to make a deal. I will praise the Lord while I live. I will sing praises to the God while I have my being. So he said, until I draw my last breath, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to praise the Lord. Wow, talk about a commitment. And if you look at the, the second clause there, you know, after the colon, where, where he says, I will sing praise to my God, the second clause, uh, that particular um, construction of praise uh, is a different word in Hebrew. You can't say it in English. It's a different word for praise. It's the word uh, zamir, uh, which means praise God with an instrument. Oh, this is all the reason for you to pick up piano again. I'm just saying, how many took lessons and then I've never touched the keys? Uh, you, <laughs> you play ukulele, oboe, harmonica. I mean, I'm going low. Anybody? You know? I mean, if you can play something, what are you supposed to do with it? Praise God with it. Praise God with it. Uh, and you're like, well, you know, I'm too old to learn an instrument. Yeah, you know, you got a voice? Praise God with your voice. Now, are you on key? I don't know. That's between you and God. Uh, you know, but, but, but praise God with that voice. And if you've got a really good voice, then you should be auditioning and singing on the worship team. You know? Uh, my sister Marla uh, went home to be with the Lord, as we all know, when she was 61 years old. Uh, and uh, had three forms of ovarian cancer. Didn't have a chance. Statistical anomaly. Uh, but she uh, had sang for many years out of Nashville as a Christian uh, artist um, and traveled like 100,000 miles a year doing concerts and stuff back in the day. Uh, but when she uh, was, when I flew out to see her for the last time uh, and, and uh, hugged her goodbye, um, at, when I was going to the airport, she admitted herself to a hospice house. She was just waiting for me to come and leave. Um, as she was dying, and comatose, she would sing. Yeah, Blessed Assurance was her favorite song. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of the Spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. How long? All day long. I would say if my sister, as a dying cancer patient, can sing in the hospice, hospice house so the nurses hear her with her beautiful voice her soprano voice you should be doing it i should be doing it because that's what we're called to do all the way to the end of life i was thinking about that this week thinking as i face the door of death what will be the song on my lips i can tell you it's not going to be the eagles you know van halen you know uh, no oh no it'd be blessed assurance jesus is mine oh what a foretaste of glory divine because why was she singing? Because she was going there. And she knew it. Why? Because the God who is the great I am had made a home for her. Because in John 8, 58, Jesus says, I'm the I am. You know what I'm talking about? Go read it. When anybody says Jesus never claimed to be God, they never read what he said. Anyway, that what I read while ago in, uh, in, in, uh, in uh, Exodus uh, 3, 14, 15, where he says, I am that I am. Uh, Jesus calls himself that, the same thing in the Greek text. Um, uh, he just uses the Greek verbs for that. Uh, so what are you supposed to do? Rule, praise God. Number two, how long are you supposed to do it? So all your life. And, well, 
I'll just give you a, an assignment as you go back out into the snow. Will you sit down to say to the Lord today, God, you can count on me. I commit this day to be a man, a woman, a high school student, a college student, a praise. I'll stop my complaining, and I'll just start looking for stuff to praise you for. Now, and number three, uh, the reasons for praise. Wow, there's, there's, there's this amazing stuff in here. The reasons. So he's going to tell you, like, well, like, what are the reasons for praise? Notice what he says. Uh, don't trust in princes, politicians. That's a, that's a given, right? Uh, in mortal men, um, uh, in whom there is no salvation. His spirit departs, he returns to the earth, and in that very day, uh, his thoughts perish. Gone. Whatever degrees he had, accomplishments, and everything, gone. You always say, he will be remembered. <laughs> but he ain't going to remember anything. He's gone. So, uh, he, you know, he, Israel had a problem uh, always uh, going to other countries for support. God said, trust in me, no matter how, what happens, I'll be with you to protect you. What'd they do? Well, we kind of need the Egyptian army on our southern flank. Oh, oh, now we need the southern, we need the Syrian army on our northern flank. Oh, now we need the, you know, they're constantly going to their, their enemies. And God said, don't do that. Just trust me. Because if you, if you put your hope in a politician, you're going to get disappointed, right? Why? He says, they're mortal. They're mortal. They, if they're mortal, then they have Adam's sin about them. All of them, Republican or Democrat, right? They all have sin about them. So they can't, they can't even fix the virus. Right? I mean, either side can claim to fix it, can they? I don't know. Now they're saying it's probably going to be with us like till the end of time. I just passed somebody uh, picking up my mom the other day, guy in the front seat, guy in the back, uh, lady in the back seat. They both have masks on. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> is it going to come through the air vent and just nail you? I mean, like what? I don't get it. And, and I'll probably get in trouble for talking about that. But it's thoughts I have in my mind. <laughs> because when you think about the world we live in, it's like, you can't solve these things. Yeah, you can give it a good shot, but there's limitations. Because all these people have clay feet, and they have limitations. And just study the Old Testament, you understand they had a huge limitations. Hezekiah, great man of God, godly man that he was, great man of prayer. But in a moment of pride and arrogance, he allowed the Babylonians in to see all the wealth of Israel. Good idea, bad idea. Bad idea. Babylonians went back to Babylon and told Nebuchadnezzar, man, you cannot believe how much gold they have. Guess what they did? Let's attack them. And they did in three ways and took their city. So, uh, you know, you could go all throughout the Old Testament. Uzziah, the great king, um, God-fearing man, but in a moment of utter weakness, he traverses the boundary between king and priest, and he tries to do worship that a priest would be doing. What did God do? Struck him immediately with leprosy. Imagine, he had it till he died. A constant testimony, do not pridefully act that way like a politician. Trust me. So he says, uh, if you want to praise God, don't trust in uh, politicians. They can't ultimately help you. It doesn't mean that politicians can't help us, because they do, on both sides of the equation. They, they do help to a degree, but the ultimate I am can help you. Uh, and additionally, in addition, Peter tells us in uh, Acts 4, uh, Jesus, you know, the great I am, He's the stone, he tells the, the, the Jews, which was rejected, rejected by you, the builders, but which became the very cornerstone. And then he adds this in verse 12. He says, there's salvation in no one else, uh, for there's no one other name under heaven by which is given among men by which they, not my being. You want to get saved before God? You must come by way of Jesus. He's the great I am. Great reasons to praise because he can solve the spiritual virus of sin. That's the main problem. Uh, so I just have to ask you as a side note, are you placing too, too much emphasis upon uh, earthly leaders to solve said problems? Maybe. And not focusing enough on God Almighty. Uh, verse 5, he says, How blessed are those who have help, help from the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Now, of all the names of God he could choose, why did he choose the God of Jacob? Why did he throw that in here? I mean, think about it. Did Jacob have issues? <laughs> Boy, didn't he? If you're going to pick somebody to bring the Messiah through, you probably wouldn't pick him. Now, what would you say were his main issues? Well, he liked to lie, and he was very deceptive, right? I mean, like, how did he get the birthright over Esau? By just asking, hey, brother, could I be the, you know? Uh, no, no, he deceived his brother, put on hairy, because Esau was hairy. He, he put on hairy skins, and he went to his dad and everything, totally deceived his dad, totally deceived his brother, and, man, he had issues. And here he says, 
This is the last beatitude, by the way, in the book of Psalms. How blessed is he, you, whose help is the God of Jacob. Now, now think about it this way. God takes broken, messed up, dysfunctional people and families and uses them to his glory. Did you hear me? You, you got all that perfect families here? Yeah. Your marriage is perfect? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I should do a series on lying and deception. Yeah. But um, so Jacob, here's this messed up guy, all kinds of issues. Uh, he's a liar. He's a deceiver. But he's a godly man. And everything he does is with great zeal. I mean, down to wrestling with, well, they don't know if it was pre-incarnate Jesus or the angel. I mean, everything he did was with total zeal. But when you look at uh, this pr one particular chapter, chapter 28, this is amazing. It says, Behold, the Lord stood above it and said unto him, you know, the angels coming down on the ladder into heaven, down to him. He saw into God's domain. And as the angels are ascending and descending, God says to him, uh, I am the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, the ontologically existent one, the God of your father Abraham, the God of Isaac, in the land upon which you lie. I will give it to you, Jacob, to all your issues, and to its descendants, your descendants shall also be like the dust of the earth. You'll spread out like the east and the west to the north and the south. And in you, your, your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with someone as dysfunctional as you. That's basically what he's telling him. And I'm reading that this week going, that's why he uses this. Because what are we? We have issues. Don't tell me. Don't sit there and go, well, not me. I mean, yeah, 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 you do. Yeah, we all have issues. Uh, and even though our sin is forgiven before Christ at the moment of salvation, we have all kinds of things we need, baggage we need to work on. But thank God that the, the God of heaven, the almighty one, looks down from heaven and says, no, I, I can use you. In fact, you're the kind of person I use to touch other lives. So you're blessed if the God of Jacob is your God. Six, he says, this God made heaven and earth to see that it, all that is in them who keeps faith forever. He made everything. He made the heavens. So this is a... This is where God puts evolution on notice. Because what does it say? He made the heaven and the earth. How did he do it? Ex nihilo, out of nothing. He, he just made it. Poof. Creative word, there was. Uh, imagine, our observable universe is 93 billion light years across. How fast does light travel? The science section. 186,000 miles per second. Or in one year, 6 trillion miles. And our galaxy is 100,000 light years in diameter. There went my math skills. <laughs> I was like, that's mind-boggling. To think of that massive size just of our galaxy, and to think that the great I am wants to know me, wants to know you, looks at your dysfunction, still wants to use you. It's, it's mind-boggling. He made the earth, the cosmos, all that is in it, the sea. That it, I mean, think about it. I, I did a research this week. How many kinds of fish are in the ocean? Try it. Just Wikipedia that one. Let it take up the rest of your week. Because um, I used to deep sea fish all the time out of uh, well, Santa Cruz, uh, San Diego, San Francisco. I've been all up and down the coast of California. I mean, the king salmon, uh, redfish, uh, Pacific halibut, uh, lingcod, tuna. Right? I mean, it, it's, it's just too much fun. And there's just all this variety that's out there. And you bring it up. I mean, when I've gone deep sea fishing, Starting at four in the morning, you catch something and you bring it in into the boat, and out pops all this color. You're like, whoa, it's amazing. God could have made the planet totally boring. All the fish were the same. But you bring them up, all this orange and beautiful, the rock cod, they come up, they're orange, they're beautiful, they have camouflage and everything. It's like, how creative God is. He could have made it totally boring and uncreative, but man, he was thinking of fishermen. How amazing is God? We should praise him. Praise him. Uh, you can also pray when you're fishing, too. God, put the fish on my line. I've done that, too. Uh, by the way, that does not work for me. I've actually sat on the back of the boat and prayed one night, God, you own all the fish in the lake. Could I have one? I, I, it didn't happen. Anyway, back to my sermon. So God made all these things, all, all the fish, everything is in him, everything. So think about this. Th these are all effects. This is an argument for God. It's called the cosmological argument or the Kalam argument. Uh, there's two versions of this particular argument. But that particular argument uh, is uh, it's a horizontal argument. The vertical we won't cover today. But, but it says it's just logical. Everything that begins has a cause, right? Chair, glasses, your shirt, your, your car, snow shovel. It had a cause. The universe had a beginning. We all know that. Therefore, what's the summation from those two concepts? Well, the universe had to have a cause. Scientists will admit that. Yeah, it had a cause. 
Concerning that, uh, J.P. Moreland says, things just don't pop into existence from nothing without no cause. It's metaphysically absurd to think that such could happen, but nothingness is the absence of anything whatsoever. Uh, it is hardly a candidate for generating the universe. The laws of nature can only govern uh, the changes and transitions and things that already exist. No kidding. Because if matter is not eternal, then where'd all that come from? Um, he goes on to add, because it's a logical question. Again, I'm asked this question all the time. Uh, some may object that if we hold that all events in which something comes to be need causes, then the child asks, where'd God come from? <laughs> Who caused God? Uh, but we, he says we can consistently hold that all such events need cause and that God does not need a cause because God is not an event. He is, remember? He's the I am. But God, if he exists at all, is a necessary being, a being which, if he exists, couldn't be such that if he did not exist, he's the self-existent, uncreated creator of all else who simply exists in and of himself, period. Because cause-effect can't go back into infinity based on the law of infinite regress. You have to have something outside of cause effect to start the chain. That can only be God. Science can't answer that question. We can. We can. How does it goes on to say here in verses seven and nine? He executes justice for the oppressed. He gives food to the hungry. He sets prisoners free. How does God give justice to the oppressed? A variety of ways. Sometimes he personally intervenes, like the Jews were slaves in Egypt. Um, sometimes he works behind the scenes, like with Esther and Mordecai, to free them, etc. It says on here that he uh, uh, gives food to the hungry. How does he do that? Um, every time that you give uh, money or food to Echo or to the Lamb's Center, whose hands and feet are you? The hands and feet of Christ. In fact, he says in Matthew uh, 25, 42, that he will reward you on the day of judgment because you gave him a cup of cold water. Or you gave him food. And the, and the Christian will say, Lord, when did I, when did I do that? Well, when you, etc. This is what God does. He causes his rain to fall, his snow to fall on the just and the unjust. It's just, it's just God. So he does feed the hungry. It also says that he sets the prisoners free. And I, coming from a law enforcement family, had to really think about this. He sets the prisoners free. Well, does that mean that he does not support the premise, if you do the crime, you shouldn't do the time? I mean, God, is he saying, I'm, I'm against people going to prison? And that's not what he's saying. Uh, because God is just, remember? He's just. So there has to be justice for crimes committed. But he is concerned about people that are incarcerated unjustly. I mean, like uh, Joseph, thrown in the pit, then, then Potiphar's wife, false charges, uh, John imprisoned on the Isle of Patmos, uh, et cetera, Daniel in prison, et cetera. He's, he's concerned about unjust convictions. Uh, I did a little research. I think I have a chart. Yeah, wrong, <laughs> DC, what would a sermon be without a chart? Wrongful convictions. 21,725 years have been served by people who were convicted unrightly in our prison system. It happens. And then it goes down and gives you some of the contributing factors. And I used to be the sheriff chaplain for 1,300 officers. They have clay feet too. I love law enforcement, but they're, they're men as well. They make mistakes. And so there are people who've been incarcerated, and probably still are, uh, on trumped up charges. And what, what does God say to them? I see you, and you're important to me. Because he's considered, he considers justice. Justice. Verse 8 says he opens the eyes of the blind. Did he when he walked the planet? Yes. Uh, he raises up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. Did he raise up many people that were bowed down? Yeah. The woman with the issue of blood. Right? He stopped that. Uh, lame people who couldn't walk. He gave them new legs. Yes. He does that. It says the Lord protects strangers. He, he protects strangers. This is interesting. Uh, the word strangers in, in uh, Hebrew is the word ger. Uh, stranger is a foreign immigrant who is in the country legally. That's what it means. Because there's another word in uh, Hebrew, uh, nekar, which means an immigrant in your country illegally. This is a whole other study. But he says he, he protects the ger, the, the alien who's resident legally based on Mosaic law. He provided for them to be in the country, observed Jewish laws and regulations. He cared for them which by definition means anybody in the country illegally, God said you must take care of them, but they must still face the law of said country based on Mosaic code. That's a whole other discussion. But God said at the end of the day, take care of people that are needy. That's what he says. And he says if, you are a, if you're fatherless, if you're a widow, God's eyes on you. If you're, if you're going through a divorce right now, and if you're going in like a custody battle, whatever it is you're facing, or if you lost your husband, whatever it is, God's eyes specially on you. 
because he loves those who have needs because he wants to help meet those needs. He wants to heal your hurts. He'll go before you. Those are all reasons to praise him. And in case you forgot what you should be doing, uh, what's verse 10 say? Well, the reality of the whole thing is the Lord will reign forever. Thy God, O Zion, to all generations. The last command is praise the Lord. So today we conclude. I'm not going to pray. I'm just going to say praise the Lord for who he is, how great he is. And uh, you should go out into the, the snow and walk into the parking lot and thank God for this day as I wash and wax both of my cars Friday and Saturday. And I didn't even get to enjoy them. So I had to walk into my garage this morning and go, praise God for what I see out there. Anyway, great to have you today. Lord bless you. Uh, you have all the answers uh, for spiritual life. Go share them. Yeah, have a good day.